but the Denver team seemed to be doing pretty well. They, they seemed to be, they were recruiting some of the best players. Um, they were marketing heavily. Uh, they were selling out a lot of games in Denver. And I think everyone around the league was like, well, what's the secret? And it turns out the Casey brothers were, uh, were not just focused on volleyball. They also had a, a drug enterprise going in and around the team. Now they kept it separate from the players, but the, the ownership and the management and some of the staff that they had hired um, got ensnarled in this uh, major marijuana scandal um, that became um, a pretty big drug bust uh, that the Denver police executed um, that ultimately kind of put the nail in the coffin for the league as a whole. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Greetings and salutations, everybody. This is indeed Tim Hanlon. How are you? Thanks for joining me here on Good Seats Still Available, uh, that curious podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Today, we have uh, gone way downstairs into the basement. Uh, We've uh, taken our flashlight and we've discovered a box that we didn't even know was there in the corner. We've blown off the dust. We've opened it up and inside we have found something called the International Volleyball Association, uh, which was the uh, attempt at pro volleyball in the late 1970s, uh, actually from 75 until 1980, and uh, is a fascinating story that our guest, Mike Jacobs, the uh, director and producer of the ESPN 30 for 30 film called Bump and Spike, uh, will be regaling us uh, with in a few minutes. Uh, Bump and Spike is the movie name. Uh, If you are listening to our show Uh, In the latter part of April, when the show drops, uh, you still may have a chance to see it uh, during its debut week at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. Uh, If you're listening to us after uh, late April, uh, you can find Bump and Spike uh, on ESPN's various television and digital platforms uh, sometime later this spring, earlier, early this summer, and it is well worth uh, looking out for. It's called Bump and Spike. And uh, it's the International Volleyball Association and the wild times of it. I don't want to sort of give it away, but, um, you know, this is a league that was created by a bunch of Hollywood moguls on the bet that uh, along with other sports and leagues that were sort of flourishing or or at the time in the 70s, that professional volleyball might actually have a shot at uh, the uh, uh, American sports uh, fan experience. And, uh, you know, some very famous people part of this, Barry Diller. Uh, Mr. ABC and uh, Paramount, and, and then later on Fox, uh, was part of the ownership group. Uh, you had David Walper, uh, who was the uh, producer of things like Roots uh, and the Thornbirds, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, and just legacy television production um, uh, from from him as part of the mix. You had Barry Gordy, uh, the founder and the CEO of, of Motown Records, uh, as part of this mixture as well. And, and just a star-studded array of major uh, A-League uh, uh, Hollywood talent uh, behind the founding of this league. And, and you know, the story behind that and, and it's uh, uh, floundering, frankly, really relatively quickly. Uh, Will Chamberlain is part of the story, uh, obviously known for his basketball prowess, but was a very uh, fine volleyball player and enthusiast in his day as well. Just so many interesting stories uh, to unwrap in this. And I'm not going to waste any more time uh, in setting this up. Here is our conversation with documentarian Mike Jacobs about Bump and Spike coming to ESPN. And here's our conversation. All right. So, hi, Mike Jacobs. Thank you for uh, for joining me here on the uh, Fledgling Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to participate. So a little bit of background before kind of we jump in. I mean, uh, Mike, you're a, um, uh, a quite prolific, actually, a documentary filmmaker, especially in the realm of sports. Um, for those who are not familiar, um, you know, well, actually should be familiar with the ESPN 30 for 30 or ESPN Films brand. It depends on who, who's calling it what these days, it seems. But um, you want to give us a little bit of background on, on, on the, the two films that you've done prior, and then we'll sort of segue into why we're here today. Sure. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me. And um, the first film I made uh, with ESPN was taking a look back at the history of the first high five in professional sports. 
um, which is just kind of an odd thing to even think about that there was a first high five in professional sports. Um, so it's an origin story of, you know, the infamous handshake that now, you know, is ubiquitous. Um, but it was kind of a unique story just because of one of the originators uh, was a, a baseball player. Uh, this happened in Los Angeles in the late 1970s um, with uh, Dusty Baker and Glenn Burke. And it just became this really, you know, it was a sort of a phenomenon when it happened. And, uh, and soon after this amazing high five after Dusty Baker hit a home run, uh, people started to pay a little bit more attention to who these guys were. And it turned out that Glenn Burke uh, was actually the first out, uh, outwardly gay baseball player. And so for me, it was sort of an opportunity to celebrate this fun, you know, pop culture, sports culture thing that now everybody does and doesn't even think about, uh, while also getting to, to tell Glenn Burke's story, which is sort of this touching personal story about a very well-liked baseball player who had a very difficult time once sort of his secret uh, became outed about his sexuality. And uh, that was uh, 2014, and that's called The High Five. Uh, and that's uh, wherever you can find 30 for 30 or ESPN film type stuff. And obviously, it rotates around on the ESPN television and online platforms as well. Uh, but next, yeah. year, the next, the next year, a little bit more somber uh, uh, stuff. Yeah, the second film I did uh, was another look back. Uh, this time, the 1980s, and it was a, a cocaine story in Major League Baseball. It was the Pittsburgh drug trials, which some of your listeners might remember, just because it was it was a bit of a sensation. Um, a, a couple of ball players uh, that was really centered around the Pirates, but it, it, it extended far and wide into the National League. Got caught up in a cocaine scandal where they were um, using dealing selling, giving, uh, and really just sort of down the rabbit hole of, of, of addiction. And uh, a bunch of players got uh, caught up in it, and there was a federal trial in Pittsburgh, and the players were given immunity for their testimony. Um, and it became sort of this flashpoint in uh, Major League Baseball sort of con conversation around drug use, um, you know, as, as – a lot of people know sort of greenies and, and other stimulants were a part of baseball culture in the 70s, which sort of gave way to cocaine in the 80s. They tried to sort of get control of it, um, especially after all the national attention came uh, after the drug trials. Um, and, you know, in some ways they succeeded, in other ways they didn't. Um, and, you know, we still obviously have drug, drugs and sports as a, as a problem today. Um, but it was, it was another one of these... Um, you know, opportunities for me to sort of look back in history and mine the ESPN archives for interesting footage and interesting stories and, and get some players to sit down and talk on camera. Um, so that was a, a, a unique project. But yes, a little bit more somber. So, it, uh, so but still a tremendous uh, sort of uh, uh, experience and, and background in, I guess, anything else you want to do with ESPN films and 30 for 30, um, a good track record. So walk us through how you got to this thing called the International Volleyball Association. Well, you know, I think f for me, uh, you know, I love um, I love sports and I love sports stories um, and especially the sort of lesser known stories that the high five is a great example of just sort of something that I don't think a whole lot of people know about. I had certainly never heard of it. And the International Volleyball Association is another one. I, I had never heard of the International Volleyball Association. Um, it was I have little flints of memory of there being some kind of Denver Comets thing where I grew up in Colorado, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't a part of, you know, any consistent memory or things that my parents talked about or took us to. So, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but as I started making these ESPN 30 for 30s, I wanted to find another story that, you know, was interesting, funny, forgotten, dustbin, um, that would have a rich trove of archival material. And I came across the International Volleyball Association, and I was just floored because I just couldn't believe that there was this professional co-ed league and that there were all these Hollywood you know, movie moguls and Motown people and then Wilt Chamberlain. And it just, it took me a while to, I mean, I'm still wrapping my head around it just because the league became so disparate and had so many different parts and pieces to it and, and different players. And um, it was just a really fun look back um, at, uh, at unique sports culture from the 1970s into the early 1980s. And the league really only lasted five years. So it was, we're talking 75 to 80. It was a, it was a short run. Well, you have, you have stumbled across a uh, a fellow uh, 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 
party who is interested in, in forgotten things and leagues and teams and whatnot, and maybe some conversations in the months and years to come perhaps could generate some some further topics. But let's let's uh, uh, tell our audience that the uh, the movie is the movie is called. Uh, that sounds like the uh, your uh, marketing department is. Uh, well, there we go. In, there we go. Hang on a quick second. No problem. All right. Hopefully, we're going to edit this so there's not barking dogs all over the Clear, podcast. Cl- clearly, the uh, public relations team at uh, Team Jacobs not happy with how the interview is going so far. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. No subtle signs there. Uh, but the movie uh, we're uh, we're referencing is called Bump and Spike. It is uh, debuting at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival. Congratulations on that world debut later this month in April. Uh, I think this Thank this ep- this episode is going to drop sometime around that time. But uh, if you've missed it by then. Uh, you'll probably be listening to this episode prior to uh, its debut somewhere along the ESPN platforms, uh, digital and television and the like. Uh, I'm told by your PR people that uh, that's sometime uh, later this spring or early summer, uh, but it's called Bump and Spike. And um, maybe you can describe for the audience, and I, I've seen it twice now, it's it's just, it's so well done, so well edited and, and so well shot. Um, can you describe, without giving everything away, a bit of what sort of it's about, uh, not just the IVA, but sort of the, maybe some thematics as to sort of how you approached telling the story of this forgotten league? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, with a project like this, it starts with trying to figure out, you know, what the narrative is going to be. And, and, you know, in this case, we've, we found that through our research and through the players that were um, a part of the league and through, you know, the, the relevant archival material that we were going to get our hands on, that we were really just going to follow the league from, from start to finish and not try to focus on any one event and just try to cover it broadly. Just because, like I said before, there were so many parts and pieces to this thing, um, just between the owners to the players, to the different teams in different cities, to the successes and failures. So the goal was to, to try to find a couple of really strong voices that were going to be our narrators, a couple of spokespersons. And so we, we researched um, a number of the top players and some of the organizational leadership around the league. And they were, of course, really thrilled uh, at the opportunity to share their story because, you know, like you and I know, this is not a very known, you know, even if you're a, an aficionado of old YouTube videos of some of these, you know, funky leagues and nascent franchises from the 70s and 80s. This is one that still slips under the radar, even with the profile of Wilt Chamberlain. So when we reached out to a couple of these players, uh, they, they pounced at the opportunity to share their story because they, they look back at, at this time very fondly because this was the first time anyone ever tried to do professional volleyball uh, in the United States and, and do it earnestly. You know, even though you know, as we find out in the film, it became a very difficult task uh, to pull this off. A lot of these uh, players and, and former owners and, and you know, organized uh, organizers, you know, they were really passionate and they still are very passionate about volleyball, about athletics. Um, and these were also, I, I have to add, I mean, they were phenomenal world class athletes that were a part of this thing. You know, they went and found players and I can back up into some of the specifics around you know, some of the people who started this thing, but the the quality of play was actually really very high. And, and there were some tremendously gifted and talented athletes that um, came from all over the world. So they really, you know, put their best foot forward in trying to make this thing work. Um, sports franchises for a variety of reasons, you know, have success and failure as, as you know, much better than I do, Tim, but it's, it is one of those sports that can be kind of challenging to try to figure out how to build an audience. And yet they, they did get these, you know, superstar athletes and their idea of mixing men and women on the court at the same time was novel and, you know, pretty sure it was gimmicky, but it was also pretty fascinating. And there was an interesting game dynamic between the women playing sort of backcourt defense and the men obviously playing at the net and, and, you know, still attacking and, and um, what you saw there was sort of this redefinition of of a strategy, you know, where women were really uh, passing the ball and, and the men were relying on those passes. And, I, you know, it was awkward for a little while as the men and women sort of had to feel each other out on the court to figure out how this was going to work. And, um, and ultimately, the teams that were the most successful were the teams that um, had the 
strongest relationship between the men and the women players as far as an offense building you know building their offense around a really good clean pass into a, a set and then of course a spike so uh how did the um and, and the film touches on this but uh the, the genesis of starting a pro league around volleyball actually emanated out of uh the 72 olympics right and and it's international yeah. interest and and curiosity i guess from from some of the the moguls that uh, kind of put it together yeah a bunch of a bunch of hollywood guys went down to munich uh to go to the olympics in 1972 they were taking in sports and some of them were were you know filmmakers that had worked in television and had done sports programming and sports documentaries so these were sort of fans of sports and entertainment but they're at the munich games and they're checking out all sorts of different um, sporting events, and they go to volleyball, and they see these these matches in indoor volleyball at these, um, you know, rowdy arenas, and they see these, you know, world class athletes, really exciting, compelling, you know, competitive matches, and they sort of think to themselves, you know, why don't we have this sport in the United States? And so they came back. This is, you know, this was after the '72 games in Munich. So '73, '74, they come back and they hatch this plan to uh, to create an upstart league. And they were going to get a bunch of, uh, you know, players that they had seen at the Olympics and some of their other, you know, uh, teammates and try to build. Um, different franchises in different cities. They did this along the West Coast, and they did a couple of franchises in in cities like you know Los Angeles and San Diego, and then smaller smaller market cities in places like Tucson and Denver, because um, their hopes were they could you know try to make a splash uh, in the in the bigger cities that were sort of volleyball friendly, that were you know culture culture fits and then also do this in places where there wasn't a, another professional sports franchise to compete with and so then they added in the hollywood thing by trying to create a unique product and put a, a product on the court that was a mix of of men and women and then use their you know hollywood uh star wattage and some of their Motown star wattage to, you know, get press, you know, try to raise the profile of people at the court, you know, coming down to the matches. A lot of the Motown people came down to the matches in San Diego and Los Angeles. And, you know, their goal was to just give this thing, you know, just enough money and just enough time and just enough of a enjoyable product on the court that it would sort of take off uh, onto a life of its own. Unfortunately, it didn't go that way. Um, but they like I said before, their intentions were really in the right place. Well, and that, that sort of thematically fits with a lot of sort of the upstart nature of professional sports in the seventies. Um, uh, my personal hook was the, uh, North American soccer league and, and professional soccer, but you know, the ABA and the mm. WFL and football and the WHA and hockey and, and, uh, world team tennis. I mean, it just seemed to be sort of this garden of, uh, let's call it sports uh, disruption or or um, novelty, uh, and this was mm. was no different. Uh, but it's pretty clear though that uh, that many of the roads of origin for this league came from um, uh, television and film producer extraordinaire David Walpert. No, yeah, it all sort of started with him. You know, this is this is you know David Walpert, who is an extremely respected uh, producer. I mean, he, you know, he had done a documentary on the Olympics that I think he had won an Oscar for, I might have that wrong. He maybe won an Oscar for a different project, but he had done a documentary on the Olympics. This was the producer of, you know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. This is someone who was extremely successful in Hollywood. And, you know, it was, it was really his brainchild and it was, it was him who was responsible for bringing some of these other um, television producers and film producers and Motown executives um, into the fold. Um, and I, and I think he was a, he was a passionate, fan of sports. He, he was a passionate fan of volleyball and it all kind of started, you know, with him and, and then who and, and how he was going to convince all these other executives to, to join him on this journey, I think was a bit of a challenge, but, but it was David who was sort of leading the charge. Well, I'm, I'm you know, it's, you have a couple of, of, of um, photos of some of the folks in there, um, you know, and I, I'm wondering if uh, of those who are still uh, with us, uh, if you uh, approached any of them, but you had people like uh, Donald Regan, uh, who was you know part of the ABA for the sort of founding, was the I guess the Treasury Secretary under the uh, with um, under the Reagan in the Reagan administration. Barry Diller, I mean you know who at the time was you yeah. know, Paramount Pictures and ABC and um, and and of course Barry Gordy, right? You know the founder and CEO of of Motown. Um, uh, 
how how did how does a a a, a collective like that of of uh, of Hollywood uh, uh, production and and uh, ownership talent sort of come together? Is this sort of the magic of David saying, "Come with I me"? Think it, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, good please. No, I think it was David. I think you know he had such a strong track record in film and television, um, and because he had done some sports uh, programs that he sort of had the credibility in the sports world and in the entertainment world. And so, you know, those names that you just mentioned, he, he was already social with those guys. You know, some of those guys were at the Olympics with him in 72. Um, you know, those guys are, are guys that, you know, went on to were already in the midst of extremely successful careers and went on to really successful careers. And so I think that they had some money that they, that he knew that they would be willing to sort of put up and, and commit to this. Um, I mean, you mentioned Barry Gordy, you know, the fact that Barry was, you know, a part of um, a part of this league is, is just so interesting just because, you know, he came from, you know, more of the Motown uh, side of things and not necessarily the Hollywood television side of things. But he wanted to get into the movies and he was friends with David Walper. And so, you know, David convinced Barry to you know, own one of the franchises, the San Diego franchise and, um, and put some money into it because he made some introductions on, on behalf of, of Barry in Hollywood and, and got Diana Ross into the movies and, and got her into, um, film and television projects. And so, you know, I think it was just this sort of circle of, of friends and, and this, you know, circle of colleagues that, uh, that bear, or excuse me, that David was able to sort of convince he, he did have to make probably some introductions that, um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that put, um, that put certain projects, uh, on the table that maybe, uh, were a challenge for him to, to deliver on. Um, but you know, again, like this was about these guys trying really hard to, um, to pull something off. Um, you know, so. Well, you mentioned it before. Um, it's pretty clear that, uh, certainly in the early days and frankly for, for actually all of its, of its short life, there were, really high quality players that they brought into the mix coaches as well. Um, we'll get to the, probably the biggest known star in a minute, but um, it seems like that the, uh, the Olympics, both 72 and 76 basically was sort of a pipeline of major talent. I mean, international stars from Poland and Brazil. And I mean, it seemed like they spared uh, to a certain extent, no expense to get truly as, as much of the greatest talent that they could find in the, in the volleyball field. Yeah, they went deep. You know, they went deep into South America and into Eastern and Western Europe. Um, you know, they basically checked all of those uh, rosters from the Olympic squads. And a lot of those players were already getting paid, you know, quite well to play professionally in in Europe, in Japan, in Latin America. And so what they did was they they designed the league to take place during the summers. And as a result, they were able to recruit some of these players who had an off season um, from their, you know, primary club team or their primary uh, paycheck and come and play in the United States in in the IVA um, during their what would what, what would have in years prior been their off season. And so, you know, they had like world class, you know, players like Stan Gosiniak. Um, who sort of redefined, you know, offense on the court and, and kind of was the guy who was, uh, is responsible for um, creating a new style of offense that you see in volleyball today, which was really that everything runs through the setter and the setter sort of commands the offense by calling a set of plays, you know, two or three steps ahead of time by signaling to his players and then uh places passes in very specific places where other players are jumping ahead of that pass and the timing becomes uh, really intricate. And, um, you know, it was, it, he was sort of known as sort of this Peyton Manning style of mind. Um, so they got players like Stan Gasiniak. Um, they got, you know, some of the best players in the USA at the time, guys like John Stanley, uh, Rudy Suara, um, players that were really respected, uh, you know, nationally and internationally. Um, and, and again, that was about them coming out and saying, okay, we're going to do this right. Like we, you know, we know entertainment, we know television, um, and, and David Wolper knows sports, but we want to make sure that we have credibility coming out of the gate. And the same thing for the women players. They went and found women players from national teams from Japan, um, Peru, uh, and then here in the United States, they had players like Linda Fernandez, who was 
you know, arguably at the time in, in the late seventies into the early eighties, considered one of the, ba- one of the greatest all around female athletes in sports. Um, she had won an ABC superstars competition. She was like a world-class Olympic high jumper. Um, you know, she was a, you know, very successful in a, in a variety of different sports. And so, you know, they just wanted that competition um, and that gameplay to be as good as it possibly could be in order for, you know, the league to kind of, come out and, and find its footing uh, for, from a fan base perspective. It seems like there was also a, a pretty strong contingent of uh, beach volleyball players as well, which is obviously a major thing, has been for, for many years on the West Coast, but it almost felt like that was a natural complement to some of these sort of world-class, you know, international players as well to make sort of a nice combination. Yeah, the beach game, I mean, a lot of these guys, they played year-round, right? So And they played on the beach and they played indoor on the court, um, you know, they, they, for them, volleyball was, was a lifestyle and full time. And especially in Southern California, as, as volleyball was, you know, starting to become popular in the United States, you could go out to the beaches in Santa Monica, um, and down all the way down the coast into San Diego, and you would see sort of world-class beach volleyball going on. And, and some of those players ended up in the IVA as well. And this was before, you know, USA volleyball really had a strong, um, you know, system of recruiting and of uh, taking players, you know, from the beach into the court. Um, but again, they, you know, they, you know, they knew that if they wanted to fill these teams out um, competitively and feature American players that they could build off of, they were going to have to look to the beach as well. All right. So let me ask you maybe perhaps the first penetrating question of the day. Um, you know, you'd think, right, with a, a star studded ownership group, and, and visionary folk in the realms of television and filmed entertainment and just the entertainment industry overall, that they would have thought or figured out that television was crucial or at least important to spreading the word about this league and, and getting it publicity and, and, and uh, attention. I think they could be rightly criticized for that. Yeah. I mean, I, they had a real challenge figuring out how to partner with a broadcaster. And, you know, un- unfortunately, you know, David Walper has since passed and guys like, you know, Barry Diller didn't return our phone calls when we requested to, to, to interview them. Uh, Barry Gordy as well. His people never got back to us. Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is maybe not, not something on their, on their uh, records that they wanted to uh, make a huge part of their, of their history. But, um, but anyways, yeah, they, they struggled. They struggled to figure out how to, get this on television. I think in the end, they got a couple of minutes once a week on Wild World of Sports. They were able to get, you know, one or two players on Johnny Carson. Um, But generally speaking, they never really had, uh, you know, and also, lest, lest we not forget, the cable television and sports television was so different from what it is today. I mean, we're so used to now, you know, ESPN having four or five channels, the tennis channel, the NFL network, Major League Baseball. I mean, all these different, you know, very specific sports programming, niche programming, obviously the Internet. It's sort of constant and easy to forget that, you know, there were only the major networks back then. And so the choices were really limited and the competition for getting attention was really challenging. And it's really always been about football, baseball and basketball. And so they, they really struggled. I think that their goal was to create the demand, you know, start selling out the arenas, you know, start to partner with major brands, um, you know, start to elevate the profile through the different superstars and the athletes and, and Wilt Chamberlain, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, they, they were really never able to get a consistent uh, broadcast partner, which, yeah, I agree. I was surprised given, given the background of these guys. I think they were surprised at how challenging it was once they put the product on the court. I think they, they sort of thought, if you build it, they will come. And, um, and it just never happened. Well, so I, I will put it out to our listeners, uh, as I uh, will tend to do. Um, uh, from what I understand, uh, I read somewhere, I think, that uh, there was indeed one, uh, aside from your uh, the ABC uh, Wide World of Sports stuff that you're mentioning, uh, the broadcast of the uh, All-Star Game, I guess, in 1977, uh, that uh, was carried on CBS. Now, uh, many of my listeners will know from my sort of uh, geekdom in the realm of professional soccer, uh, CBS was also very active in the once in a while broadcasts of things like Pele's first game and the NASL and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, there are a bunch of games out there, uh, uh, including this one, it seems, that seem to be uh, 
um, somewhat lost to history. And you wonder where that that footage might sort of live. And I'm sure you you went uh, high and low trying to find that. And if anybody would have discovered it, it would have been you. But, um, you know, it is out there and you wonder how uh, and th- how that looked and was presented um, and whether that could have made a difference or or maybe what the reaction to it was. Well, I think, you know, I think that, well, I, well, I have to back up and say, too, that um, one of the greatest challenges with uh, with these ESPN projects and, and is uh, is the archival material. A lot a lot of that archival material is is quite expensive to license. And so even when we came across, we actually came across some pretty awesome um, stuff, even from like Johnny Carson of Johnny Carson playing volleyball with Linda Fernandez and Mary huh. Jo Pepler um, and some of the players that were, you know, in the league at the time. And, and they taught, we were talking about the league um, licensing material from Johnny Carson's show is like it, very cost prohibitive. Um, and, and that all-star game that you mentioned is from CBS we did get uh, a line on that footage, but the barrier of entry was quite high. And so these are not unlimited budgets and you have to sort of pick and choose sure. and you have to um, turn over every stone and then try to figure out how you're going to make what footage work where even some of the Getty archives, which have a tremendous amount of, of wonderful still photographs from the league. Some of their best stuff is the sports illustrated photography. And that's also pretty expensive. That may be more uh, inside baseball around uh, how these productions work than your listeners care to know. No, it's but, great. Um, it, you do you don't have carte blanche and um, and especially with a project like this that relies so heavily on unearthing this material in order to like show and try to explain what happened it it can be challenging um, so we we had to rely mostly on the film reels that we got that were created by the league and then um, a certain amount of archival from the usual suspects like Getty Images and the AP um, and then from people's you know personal archives. Um, and so it can be a little bit of a challenge really with all of these projects that are in the seventies and eighties. Um, you know, some of them just lack coverage and some of them have coverage, but they're, um, very expensive to even, you know, get copies of, let alone license. Well, it, 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 that's, uh, the whole process is indeed fascinating. And, and, um, uh, you know, the idea, I, I, frankly, the, the stuff that you did get and it is in the movie, I thought it was just, it, it was tremendously done. Frankly, I don't want to give it away, but the, some of the, the footage at the very beginning of the movie um, uh, there is a dulcet, the dulcet tones of, of one of the well-known ABC network voiceover guys at the time, uh, giving a real tonal base to, uh, uh, the excitement that is the IVA is, it's just a great scene setter. Um, so yeah, you, you gotta be commended for what to, you did find. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty hard to, um, it, you, I fell in love with that footage the moment I heard it, let alone saw it, you know, that guy's voice is just so perfect. It's so on the nose. And um, in all the right ways. And it really does, like you said, nicely set the tone for the film because you're you're dropped immediately into that era through through the voice, through the music and and then through this, you know, funky. I think that's all 16 millimeter, you know, film stock that has been through about 16 different transfers before it winded up wound up in our hands. And um, and so you're seeing this stuff, uh, you know, kind of in a raw form and in a form that was never overly polished or produced. Um, and then you're seeing it generations later, you know, it's a long time ago. And the fact that that footage still exists at all, um, is kind of remarkable. Um, and it was really one of the more enjoyable parts about making a film like this is turning over those stones and seeing what, what comes up, you know, getting a hold of some of the, you know, original programs, some of the magazine covers, you know, some of that stuff is 30, 40 years old. And the fact that it's out there at all, you know, we found a bunch of stuff on eBay and then went to the, the rights holders and they, you know, a lot of the rights holders we can even track down because it was so long ago and so forgotten. Um, but, you know, just even going back to some of these beach volleyball players and having their images from the, this was the early 1970s to the mid 1970s as beach volleyball sort of first kind of taking off in Southern California and getting some of these images of, of some of these world-class players and, and athletes like Wilt Chamberlain playing beach volleyball, um, just getting access to the, to those images is just, it's kind of mind blowing because it just takes you to this, 
in, incredible nostalgia for this era that you just wouldn't see today. You'd never see an athlete of Wilt Chamberlain's stature, you know, running down to the piers of Santa Monica to go play beach volleyball with uh, with Jay Hansis and Rudy Suara, you know, a couple of, of pro volleyball players. It just wouldn't happen today. There'd be a media circus around it and there'd be brands and agents and managers and, you know, it would be it wouldn't, it wouldn't be sincere, you know, it would be sort of produced. And, um, and I love that about this era. I love that about this era across all sports, the, you know, the, the sort of lack of branding and the lack of overproduction and just sort of athletes being people, um, you know, is really refreshing. And, and a lot of the archival material feels so, um, enjoyable to sort of immerse yourself in because they're not covered in brands. They're not covered. They're not surrounded by hordes. It's just, it's a little bit more pedestrian in a very refreshing way. That's a, that's a tremendous insight. And, and you wonder, I think you hinted at it before, you know, in some respects, it, if it was done a number of years later, perhaps in today's modern time weather, and perhaps it is the, the seeds of the ability for a, a league such as that to, to be much more fledgling and more, rooted today, given all the commercial and distribution opportunities that exist. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think it's just, it was a different era and, and you cover these different, um, you know, you cover these different leagues and upstarts and franchises. And I don't know, there's just what I love about it most that you can probably speak to as well is there's just a little bit more of a purity, you know, it was really just more for the love of these games and for the experimentation of sport. And, you know, I have young children now and, and, you know, getting to sort of goof around and play sports with them. Very rarely are we, you know, sure, we'll start playing some organized sports and we'll play, we'll play catch with the baseball, but very quickly they're inventing their own version of it, you know, and I love that about athletics and I love that about gamesmanship and, um, and that era that you focus on with your podcast of, of these different sports and leagues, just trying to do something different, trying to offer something different, trying to bring new sports and new, and and new athletes um, into the fold and, and onto the scene and create these leagues around it. You know, I, 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 it's so much harder to do now. I miss that, you know, about, um, about that era. Um, and I think it is just a, a, there's a little bit of nostalgia there. Sure. But I think there was just a purity and a, and a purity of gameplay, a purity of, of sportsmanship, a purity of, um, of competition that, you know, in this, in this age of, you know, over commercialized and over branded sports, you just, something gets lost for sure. You know, I still love sports and watch sports, but, um, but I do sort of pine for, um, for a different era of, and, and look, I, you know, I was, I was a kid in the eighties, so it's not like I was watching a ton of, of professional sports. Um, but you just sort of pine for an era of, you know, that unfiltered athletes are more, you know, working class, just kind of that idea of, of everyday real people going out there and just, you know, putting it all in the field. Well, okay. So go using that as a, uh, as a, uh, pretty decent segue, right? Going from one extreme a working class sort of uh, approach to another. Um, let's talk about Will Chamberlain, right? Uh, unavoidable, uh, uh, you know, star of not only this film, but also uh, a legend uh, in his own right, but also a, a pivotal, excuse me, a pivotal uh, person and persona in this league. Yeah, the Wilt Chamberlain piece of this was just another, you know, really compelling and pleasant surprise. You know, as I was doing research on uh, and pitching to ESPN on, on sports stories like this, it's really hard to get, um, you know, ESPN has an audience and their audience likes, you know, bigger, more traditional sports stories, which I understand. And so, you know, trying to sell them on a volleyball story, uh, was proving to be really challenging or really on any kind of sort of, um, I don't know, you, whatever you want to call it outside the mainstream sports story, Mm -hmm. but because of wilt, there's a hook there. Um, and, and it's a great hook because, you know, will all around what, you know, arguably one of the greatest all around athletes, one of the greatest basketball players in history, super dynamic personality, you know, intelligent, personable, extremely well liked, um, you know, awesome reputation around the people who know him and played with him. So he tears his ACL playing basketball. I think this is in 72 or 73. And he starts doing rehab on his knee. And in order to rehab his knee, he was doing a lot of calisthenics on the beach. He was doing, you know, beach jogging and and beach exercises. And as he was down at the beach in Southern California, he started to catch uh, these beach volleyball games and, and he became fascinated by it. 
and he a super competitive guy. And so he'd go up to these volleyball players and he'd say, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll bet you 10 bucks. I can beat you and let, you know, let's play. And so he would start to, you know, do these gentleman bets between him and a couple of these other, you know, at the time rising stars in the beach volleyball and, and indoor court leagues. Uh, I mentioned Jay Hanseth and Rudy Suara who appear in the documentary. He would go up to them and say like, Hey, let's, let's get a game going here. And he would more or less teach himself how to play volleyball. And they, they sort of took an interest in him and they, you know, helped, helped uh, body position, footwork, timing of his jumps. And he just fell in love with the game of volleyball. And so as a result, the guys who were a part of that founding team, the, the, the movie mogul group, you know, they knew Wilt was a fan of the game and Wilt, you know, started, you know, he, he, he also went to, you know, some collegiate matches and he just fell in love with the game because he loved the physicality of it. You know, obviously he had great height. So he, he loved the opportunity to, to get up there and stand at the net um, and, and smash the ball. But, you know, he, he loved uh, the style of play. He loved the international flavor. He was a true fan. And so they, the, the guys from this movie mogul team, they said, Hey, why don't we use Wilt as a marketing tool Um, But let's also, you know, give him the opportunity to play. And he became like a a phenomenal volleyball player, especially considering it wasn't his first sport. Um, But he was out there, you know, and he played for a number of different teams. And so um, the way that it worked is, you know, he was president of the league. So he became an executive, um, which was really just sort of uh, an opportunity to put him into a position of marketing on behalf of the league. Um, But being the competitive guy that he is and being the athlete that he was, he was sort of like, I I actually also want to play. And so they, you know, let him play on a number of different teams throughout a couple of those first, you know, three, four seasons. And, you know, he was a big draw for the crowds. Um, but for him, it was, it was about the game. He was, you know, he took every match as seriously as he would, you know, a basketball game. So it was very, very cool to see this guy who you would think would have nothing to do with volleyball, you know, and, and, and just his size on the court and his style of play. Um, it was really fun to go back and look at that stuff. But, but yet it, it, even his presence though, didn't seem to kind of get the league over the hump, right? Uh, aside from a blurb or two in Sports Illustrated, what happened this week? And if anything, you know, obviously some local press, but but nothing, you know, big, maybe except for that, that all-star game on CBS. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just, again, this fundamental problem of, of, of the product not necessarily going the right way. They would, they would sell out a couple of early matches that they promoted heavily, and they would bring Wilt and they would have, you know, Aretha Franklin sing the national anthem and they would do everything that they could to sort of kickstart this thing. But unfortunately, you know, some fans showed up and they had some core fans. But in order to get a, you know, in order to get one of these sort of franchise leagues off the ground, you got to be committed. And I think part of that commitment is financial. And I think a lot of these guys, um, you know, even with Wilt and, and even with, you know, some of their um, connections in the entertainment industry um, and trying to leverage those connections, they still just couldn't figure out the right formula. And so then it was like, well, how much more money are we going to have to put into this thing? You know, they had already, a lot of these guys like Barry Diller and, and Barry Gordy, I mean, they had spent, you know, over $100,000 of their own money and the returns were not great. And so, you know, a year plus in, a lot of those guys were bailing. You know, even D- David Walper, unfortunately, he had some health issues. And he had a, you know, he was a producer, so he always had a bunch of different projects going on. And his doctors told him, like, hey, you, you know, you need to cut a couple things out of your life here um, because there's just too much stress. And so one of the first things to go was, was, you know, the volleyball league. And so he ended up selling his franchise. And, you know, guys like Barry Gordy and Barry Diller, they followed suit because they didn't want to pour any more money into this thing because it just wasn't really taking off and they weren't getting the TV coverage. They were getting little bits and pieces of sort of outside outsider sports story coverage in the publications and it just wasn't enough. And so they all ended up selling their franchises off and the franchises were purchased um, by sort of more of these regional you know, business owners, people who owned, you know, mattress companies and trucking companies and people who, who were interested in owning a sports franchise and who saw the potential in it and saw the potential in the league that, that, you know, the Hollywood guys saw in it, but were just, um, just a different 
type of profile, a different caliber of, of businessman and woman. And, um, and they continued to run the league, but it, it, a lot of the air had been taken out of it after that first and second season. Well, and um, again, I don't want to give away uh, some of the, the story here of the movie, but the movie is called uh, Bump and Spike. Uh, it will be on ESPN sometime this late spring, early summer. Uh, if you're hearing this sometime in April, uh, you still may have an opportunity to uh, run down to the uh, Tribeca Film Festival and uh, and see it uh, in its world debut, uh, world premiere week. Um, but, you know, you're mentioning uh, the ownership kind of uh, uh, skittishness and, and the, the, the new folks that kind of sort of came in. Um, there's obviously, um, you know, certainly a, a, a major story that that in many respects seemed to hasten the, the demise of an already wobbly uh, enterprise. Uh, and that's the story of the Denver Comets. Do you want to kind of touch on the, the Casey brothers and uh, a little bit of sort of sure. how they got in trouble? Yeah, I mean, this is just, again, this this film and, you know, this story had so many fun parts and pieces to it, like I keep saying. And, and one of those was was the Denver team, the Denver Comets, which is just kind of an awesome name, kind of a, a really 70s only kind of sports franchise name. Um, but the Denver Comets, especially during the time where the league kind of started to take a turn for the worse. So it's really that first season was their best season, right? It was the most competitive. They got the most crowds out. They had, you know, a couple thousand, I think as many as 10,000 people watching the championship game in San Diego, stuff that had never really happened before in the United States. So the seeds of success were there, but the demise came pretty soon after once the, just the money dried up. Um, but the Denver team seemed to be doing pretty well. They, they seemed to be, they were recruiting some of the best players. Um, they were marketing heavily. Uh, they were selling out a lot of games in Denver. And I think everyone around the league was like, well, what's the secret? And it turns out the Casey brothers were, uh, were not just focused on volleyball. They also had a, a drug enterprise going in and around the team. Now they kept it separate from the players, but the, the ownership and the management and some of the staff that they had hired um, got ensnarled in this uh, major marijuana <laughs> scandal um, that became um, a pretty big drug bust uh, that the Denver police executed um, uh, that ultimately kind of put the nail in the coffin for the league as a whole. And uh, also exacerbated, I guess, by um, uh, the the decision not to attend the uh, the Summer Olympics in 1980, which is I'm, I'm sensing is a uh, quadrennial boost to the sport, um, you know, and coming off the heels of uh, 72 and 76, where kind of the seeds of the IVA kind of got born and, and losing that little that that push probably also didn't help either. For sure. I think the drug bust happened in 78 or 79. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy Carter cancels the Olympics in Moscow in 1980. And I think a lot of the players, you know, they were sort of waiting for that boost, like you said, and they were waiting to to capitalize once again on the attention of the world turning towards the games and, and you know, volleyball always being a popular part of the games and some of these players, their profile elevates during that, during that time period. And some of the franchises were hanging on, you know, before the drug bust, there were teams that like in San Diego and Seattle um, and in El Paso, they were doing okay. You know, they were, they were just making it. And I also have to say that the team in, um, in Arizona, uh, in Tucson, you know, they had this world-class promoter who was able to um, come up with really creative ways of getting, see, you know, getting bodies into the stands. And so they were, they were doing everything that they could, you know, in the post Hollywood era of the league to keep this thing going. But then the drug bust happens, which is a pretty big black eye followed by Jimmy Carter canceling the Olympics. And now the thing is like completely deflated and it's just such an uphill battle and franchises are folding here and there. And they just knew that they didn't have enough. So it sort of unfortunately kind of collapsed in on itself for just a variety of these different reasons. So is there anything you uh, sort of learned in the, in the making of this film and the people that you came in, in contact with? I mean, are there any sort of lessons or, uh, intrigues or, or things that uh, you didn't know before, maybe just some comical moments along the way, or maybe some heartbreaking ones too. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what was cool was to talk to these players and I said it before, just to hear how much it meant to them at the time. This was big for them. This was big for them. Some of them 
were just out of college and were put on this, you know, national stage for the first time and playing competitive volleyball in this league that showed great promise. And they're hanging out with Wilt Chamberlain and they're partying and they're, you know, living a really good life and they're flying to these different games. And it, it felt so real and so big. And all of these players look back at that time period, even with all the challenges and even with all the, you know, the, 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 the money drying up. I mean, all of them continued to play. I mean, I think every player I talked with played all five seasons of the IVA and the first two seasons they were getting paid pretty well and they were getting treated pretty well. But even after that, they, they kept playing. Cause these are, these are sports purists. These are, you know, absolutely for the love of the game, especially with a sport like volleyball, you know, that doesn't get the national attention that doesn't command the same kind of contracts or the same kind of endorsements. But these guys weren't going anywhere. They wanted to play the whole time. Even Wilt, you know, I was surprised to find out that I think Wilt played four of the five years. I mean, the guy also stayed committed to the game, even after, you know, his other Hollywood pals kind of bailed on him. So just hearing how much um, how much it meant to these players um, and getting to interview them and even just hearing from players like Linda Fernandez, who is just a world-class athlete and hearing her just tell these stories of, you know, playing with the men and trying to figure that out, you know, like, how's this going to work? And like, is this, you know, the, the challenges of, of the battle of the sexes taking place within one play, you know, and the speed of the game and the women adjusting to that, but then the men adjusting to a prolific offense built around a, a good pass, which were coming from the women. Those types of stories were, were really fun um, to, to share and, and go back and look at. Well, the, uh, the film is called Bump and Spike. And uh, again, if you're listening to this in late April, it's uh, premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, tickets, uh, perhaps some quote unquote good seats still available, although I doubt it. I'm sure it's already sold out or whatever. Uh, but try anyway. And, um, and, and more interestingly and importantly, it'll be on uh, ESPN television and digital platforms uh, soon. Late spring, early summer. Uh, keep an eye out for that. So uh, before we wrap up, Mike, um, uh, what uh, other so you've got a, a hefty dollop of of really compelling sports documentaries under your belt. Uh, any other subjects uh, in mind, uh, either for ESPN or, or otherwise uh, sports or otherwise? Well, I'm constantly, you know, I'm constantly trying to develop, um, you know, different documentary concepts and, and you know, different documentary ideas. I, I have been um, talking with ESPN about, you know, some some future projects Um and so, you know, there's a couple of sports stories that I would I would love to tell. I mean, I, I really want to uh, tell the story of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I think he's just such a, a dynamic personality, you know, an ambassador of the game and an ambassador of culture um, who has such a rich, you know, sports story and, ha- you know, can speak to the black Muslim athlete, can speak to um, Native American basketball and how important that is to those communities. Um, I, th- I think, you know, some kind of storytelling on him would be really uh, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, and then otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm constantly developing different types of documentaries at different times. So I've been, um, you know, heavily researching and developing some virtual reality projects. Um, and then, uh, and then I've also been researching the John Walker Lynn story, the American Taliban, which is not a sports story, uh, but a story from, uh, late nineties, early 2000, uh, at the beginning of the quote unquote war on terror. And, uh, and this American kid who got caught up in it at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, so, you know, just trying to keep a bunch of irons in the fire making documentaries is a challenging, <laughs> challenging lifestyle. Um, these projects take a long time, um, to figure out and they are, you know, sometimes hard to fund and sometimes hard to make. Um, but, uh, but it is a uh, an enjoyable process, and a film like Bump and Spike was, um, though you know the other thing I should mention that I think is kind of a cool best kept secret about the way we made the film mm. um, is that instead of flying all these athletes to a sound stage or instead of um, going to these athletes, which would have been cost prohibitive because these guys are spread out all over the country. Um, we brought them all to a film set in the desert of Southern California. That is an old motel film set. So you, you drive out to Palmdale, which is an hour plus outside of, um, Los Angeles. And there's this old 1970s looking film set that was built there and there are all these different motel rooms and different motifs and so we placed the athletes in the different rooms in and around this motel in order to create 
a look and feel much like these players lived at the time, which was on the road, going from city to city, living in these different hotel motels. Um, from the seventies. And it was, it was awesome because I think it put the players in the mindset of, you know, the world that we were asking them to reflect on. And I, I knew it, I really wanted to make this a, a culture and a tone piece as much as a, as a, you know, biographical piece of storytelling. I wanted that feel of the seventies to be a part of the, of the filmmaking. And, uh, and I'm really proud of the, the look that we were able to create in those interviews and in these different motel rooms. It's just kind of funny that these are all shot inside this kind of funky film set out in the desert, um, with, diff- with different rooms being the different background for each player. No, I agree. I, I, uh, again, I, I think it's, 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 it's a, it, it just, it, it's plays out so well on the screen and, uh, and, and, Maybe, too, you noticed this. Um, probably some of it is lighting and how you shot. But um, it seems like most of the players, if not all of them, seem to have uh, aged quite well uh, and preserved themselves quite well. I wonder if volleyball is uh, sort of some sort of a, a magic elixir of youth. I felt I felt the exact same way. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. I was like, I got to start playing volleyball because these guys look great, you know, and um, and, you know, my cinematographer, Michael Giolakis, uh, is an extremely talented uh, and, and creative artist. And he did wonderful work um, lighting and uh, creating these interview frames that are that are pretty spectacular to look at and um and he did a wonderful job and and yeah these players just kind of shine and i and i think they shine because they've lived very healthy lifestyles and they shine because they got to to tell a part of their history that i don't think a lot of people know about that i'm excited for for them to get to share with the world i think the players and the and the um the sort of community around the league. Um, I hope they like the film, um, but I think it's, it's long since overdue that their, that their story and this part of sports history get, gets an opportunity to be told. Well, Mike Jacobs, you will, uh, whether you like it or not, always be a friend of the show. And uh, if any other um, uh, topics in and around the world of uh, teams and leagues and the various stories behind them um, come across your desk or intrigue you, um, perhaps we'll maybe spur some interest for you, your further efforts or vice versa, if we can help promote uh or explore those uh, other issues. That's kind of what we're doing here on the show. Don't ask me why, but we're just doing it. And, um, I can't, I love it, man. I love it. I I need to, I need to take some time and dive into your podcast and, and and do some research. It sounds like you guys are mining, um, some really great stories from history. And, and I mean, that's a great place to start really for any documentary filmmaker. That's what we do, right? We mine these stories and try to figure out ways to tell them. And so, uh, you guys do a lot of heavy lifting in, in the sort of, uh, you know, dustbin of, of sports culture from an era that, you know, I think deserves a lot of attention and can command a lot of attention just because of what we said before about that kind of unfiltered purity, lack of brands, you know, sports for the sake of sports. Um, so I, I will certainly spend some time doing some research and development in, uh, in your world. Oh, you're and kind. I thank you for the, I thank you for the opportunity to, to be on the podcast. Sorry about the barking dogs. It's oh, like it's Saturday morning here. It's okay. Maybe, maybe they're, in, maybe they're excited too. Uh, but I wish you, uh, <laughs> nothing but luck, uh, on the premiere, enjoy the red carpet, all that kind of fun stuff. And again, it's bump Thanks, and spike, uh, Tribeca film festival in, in late April and coming to ESPN on various platforms, uh, in late spring and early summer. Mike Jacobs, thank you tremendously for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Thanks for having me. All right, there you have it. There's our chat with Mike Jacobs. And again, the uh, movie is called Bump and Spike. Uh, It is uh, available on ESPN television and digital platforms starting sometime in July, we think. Uh, So depending on when you're listening to this show, uh, it is either out there or soon will be Um, well worth your time it is awesome it's fun to watch Uh, even if you're not a volleyball fan uh, or even a sports fan the story is great Uh, it's not all that long and it's uh, it's it's just it's fascinating it's just it really is something else it's really well done Uh, don't forget also too that Mike has uh, uh, been the uh, filmmaker behind uh, two other ESPN 30 for 30s uh, one called the high five in 2014 uh, sort of the origins of that sort of hand slap that is uh, part of pro sports these days back in the 77 uh, L.A. Dodgers between Dusty Baker and Glenn Burke and the story that sort of emanated out of that sort of simple hand gesture. Uh, and then in 2015, uh, Mike also did uh, the uh, sh- uh, the short, actually not short, so it's about a half an hour long, called the Pittsburgh Drug Trials, which uh, recounts sort of the aftermath of the 1979 uh, champion, uh, baseball champion, Pittsburgh Pirates, and the uh, major uh, drug slash cocaine scandal that sort of uh, came out of that uh, 
that team and that story as well. Um, and uh, that also is a, a 30 for 30 well worth looking for. But uh, definitely look for Bump and Spike. Uh, it is a uh, it's a gas, as the kids would say. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's fascinating. And uh, I can't thank Mike enough for for the chat uh, about uh, something definitely from the dustiest of dusty bins uh, in forgotten sports history. Um, last uh, thing, of course, is please go to our website for all of our stuff. That's goodseatsstillavailable.com. Watch your spelling. Uh, social media at Good Seats Still is where you'll find us on Twitter. On uh, Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you'll find us on Facebook. Uh, and again, on the website, you can send us email and, and interact with us that way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love hearing from our listeners and uh, we uh, appreciate your uh, your listenership. Take care. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.